I think Jim Carrey said, I pray that all of my friends become millionaires so that they realize it doesn't answer life's problems. And this idea that, you know, I have means, but I am still, I got means because I lived on principles like choosing opportunity cost and delayed gratification. And you're in your mid to late thirties, I'm in my early forties and you go, God dang it. I have made so many sacrifices to get here. And I have controlled as much as I have been able to control to get here. And I still have cost benefit analysis moments where I still have to pick and choose. I still like, I can't just say both have my cake and eat it too. I have the resources do this. And because even when you do technically have the resources, you are still planning further down the road because you're now programmed to think further down the road. And you're like, no, I have bigger goals. I want to take care of my dad. Maybe you want to take care of your dad. Maybe I want to do something special for someone. So I, so I could have all the resources for that one decision, but not for the future decision. And being a future thinker or a bigger thinker as it comes around finances, you're like, dang gum, I have the, like the money is like right there. I can point at it like, but I'm still not going to do it. And I'm pissed about it. You know, does that make sense? Yeah, it makes perfect sense. And that's just how I feel. And it's just kind of like, mm -hmm. I think, I also think that that is part of what we talked a little bit about yesterday on our other show, shout out, not crypto bros, which is, and maybe it wasn't yesterday, but two couple days ago, which is sure. the disease of more, which the is disease like, of more. you know, and I think that that is also part of the, if that's the disease, the, the body is like the fiat standard or, or the, because we can print money, right? For example, you get to a place when you're 50 years old, right? And you have $2 million, just sure. a cool $2 million. And you're like, oh, I can just live on this for the rest of my life. I don't even have to invest it. I can literally just put it in a bank and take it out when I want. But then you realize that by the time you're 70, because of inflation, because everything's going to continue to become more expensive, yeah. you can't. And so we're stuck in a rat race. And even that, at wealthy tiers, there is a degree. Even at wealthy this. tiers. Yeah, yeah. It, especially at wealthy tiers. And I love what you said about Jim Carrey saying, and I, I've heard that quote. Uh, yeah. I've heard him say that. You know, he wishes all of his friends could become millionaires so they could like see the other side of the fence because they're always yeah. looking over and like, oh my gosh. And mm -hmm. yeah, but I think that, that all that brings us nicely into the topic of today, which is why we should talk about money. On the last episode, I, I, we talked I'm about glad why we're we, talking about this. Yeah, on the last episode, we talked about why we don't talk about money, but I felt like it's yeah. a good bookend to why we should talk about money. So yeah. when yeah. someone pushes back against you, Grant, and they're like, well, I don't want to talk about money, how would you talk to them and say, this is why I think you should talk about money? Well, okay, so that's, that's a broad question, and I like it. It um, is a broad question. <laughs> and, and context matters. And for those who don't know me, if you've seen any of my other shows, it's like, Grant, why couldn't you do more shorts or reels? Because shorts or reels are detrimental um, psychologically to someone actually attaining wealth or freedom, which is my message, you know, freedom, and, and by proxy, financial freedom, health freedom, a variety of types of freedoms, but freedom in your being. Um, there's context and context matters. I could just give you the content and be like, hey, you need to talk about money. But there's always context. So it depends. And if I'm talking to a small business client or a personal development client or a young 18 year old, my, my, the way I talk about it definitely varies. Um, but this is something I've done that you might find interesting. You might get, let's just talk about small business owners or entrepreneurial people or intrapreneurial people. You could be working a job, want more out of your life and apply entrepreneurial principles inside of your corporate job. That's entrepreneurship. So I'm just talking about hustlers, right? And any context, um, you could come to me and say, Grant, I'm not getting where I want. And. I say, well, you know, how are you spending your money? And they're like, no, that's under control. I want to talk about something else. And I'll say this. There's only two things I need to look at. Give me access to your Google calendar and give me access to your bank account this minute or we won't talk any further. The reason being, you have got to shine a spotlight on how they're investing the only two. There's only one limited resource and that's time. Um, the money itself, whether the Fed's printing more, infinite resource, or whether you believe in manifestation and law of attraction sort of stuff. And I have a strain of that I radically believe in and other strains of that that I think are just bohunk. But I do believe that 
There is something called infinite money, but we know that resources generally are pretty limited, but those are the two that we obsess about. If someone cannot show me their bank account, they are embarrassed and they're hiding from something. It's like, show me your browser history to most men. <laughs> most men are like, oh, I'm not gonna do that. They got stuff to hide. Um, and the same with your calendar. Your calendar could be over full with BS or it could be empty, which shows no direction. Your money shows the same thing. It shows, I see all your subscriptions right out of the gate. I see if you have any OnlyFans subscriptions. Like, what are we talking about? Why are we talking about, uh, you know, I wanna be a millionaire, but I haven't made my first 100K. I don't, I'm not sitting on my first 100K cash or resources or assets. I might have earned 100K, but we talked about the other day how there's plenty of Americans making over six figures or in the six figures who are living paycheck to paycheck. So it, the, how I talk about it, to answer your question, how I talk about it is open up your calendar this minute, open up your bank account this minute. And what I learn, not only are those tactical things, I also learn how they think about money. You know, I know this one guy who's very open about his sexuality. He was married for seven years, seven or eight years. Um, he was known as the guy in our conservative town as the guy who was openly polyamorous and a thruple. And in, in, the, in the Southeast, in the Bible Belt, it's like, ooh, but all the guys in his life are like, what is going on here? You know, like you wanna know something. Um, and then that changed. And he started getting very open about, listen, this is where that came from. I'm realizing men are pent up and wound up. So I therefore need the antidote is shining a light on the pros, the cons, while he'll never do it again. I'll never do this again. And, and it was very enlightening because some people think, like Jim Carrey's millionaire thing, some guys think, oh, I just wanna be in a thruple. And it's like, well, you gotta hear the real story behind the story here. And he will never do it again. And that's a good thing to hear. It's the same thing with money. What if a person even hesitates, the degree to which they hesitate to open up their bank account will tell me, this is the inner dialogue they're having. So when they wake up in the morning, are they looking at social media? They're looking at their bank accounts. You mentioned that you mentioned that the other day, and I I very much have started to adopt that, and it has changed my life. Not because I obsess about money, but if I'm going to wake up and devote over a third of my waking hours to money, which most people do if they work a forty hour job, most people are working two or three jobs. If they're going to devote over a third of their life, they better be playing to win, and you can't manage what you don't measure. So people just don't measure. Dude, I got an anecdote for this. Can I tell you an anecdote? You can tell an anecdote. Tell it. Um, I knew this guy, uh, and I'm going to anonymize this guy because money, right? People don't want to, whatever. So this guy came to me, and I had only just started building into the six figures, but I'm a coach. Like my, my gifting is coaching, hearing how people think because I pick up on how they talk about things. So I like that. Like if I had a gift on the planet, it's to hear how people are talking to themselves and call that out. So I, I developed this uh, reputation. He came to me and he said, Grant, I don't know what to do. I said, what are you talking about? This was like 2010s. He's like, I'm making passively. And, and I looked at his money, this was true. I am passively making 20,000 a month. Can you, can you dive deeper on the mechanism to how he's making that money? Just I'll so generalize. we can then dive yeah, yeah. deeper also so, to how yeah. passive it is. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like, I, I just want to qualify. Because yeah, we've talked, we don't truly, neither of us really believe in passive income. Yeah. There is one area that is the closest to real passive income. That on the spectrum of like total BS, there's like, I'm working for every ounce of paycheck to paycheck. And on the other end, I'm sitting on piles of stocks and dividends and it seems passive, but I still have to watch the earnings. I still have to pay attention. Uh, to the headlines. I think this is actually even further on the passive and you're gonna laugh. I'm excited. MLM. Oh yeah, I mean, that's... Once you build it, you don't have to manage the money. You've already developed a lifestyle of hype and relationships. And if you can mm -hmm. keep the hype alive, which you already got there by that, so you're not doing anything new with your life. So to me, especially if you have that temperament and I have that temperament, this guy had made 20,000 a month and had done it for years, like years. And he hadn't even built on it. He hadn't sold a product, hadn't sold a new membership in years. And so it was like truly passive. And I, and, but I said, well, why are you coming to me? He said, I have a philosophy. I said, what's that? He said, I came from a poor background and he did. He said, um, my measure of wealth was this. People are so funny, bro. I love this topic. 
He said, I measured wealth by being able to fill up my gas tank without looking at my bank balance. Because he had grown up with so much trauma of having to look at the bank account to feed himself and his pet. If I'm going to buy a square of ramen for my family tonight, I need to open up my accounts and look. And that, that, that had traumatized him. So that once he started making money, he said, I just need the relief of going to the gas, sta the gas station and just not looking. And, and his family had all the vehicles, his family had all the houses, and he was doing it, but he came to me because secretly, and this is what we're here to talk about today, he couldn't talk to anyone about the fact that he was thousands in debt. Whoa. Thousands in debt. And because he wasn't paying attention and because he had gotten used to this modality at the gas tank, that modality bled into the grocery store and to the entertainments and to the clothing, to the credit cards. And well, why not? The credit, you know, wealthy people do credit too. And I've got all this past, I, he couldn't fathom how little or how much 20,000 really was. Like you and I can't really fathom what a billion dollars is, right? Like we can't, we can talk about it. We can see it on paper, but we can't really fathom where leaks happen and how your assistant is grifting a hundred thousand a year. You don't even know, like you don't even know. And that's where he was. And he came to me again, I'm anonymizing this person, not even telling you what part of the country they live in. Like this person had, and I had a heart to heart zoom meeting and he was just, he was in tears and he was like, I've got a. I've got to talk to my wife. I've got to get a job. I've got to, I've got to basically file bankrupt. And we even, we even, I'm telling you how bad this is. And this guy is a good friend of mine to this day. Uh, they had to borrow $800 for that week. This to me is the ripple effect of someone who's not willing to, when I say, open up your calendar and open up your bank account. Not going to do it. That will tell me, I don't care how much you earn. I don't even care how much I see in that account. There's something that's off the rails. So that, that's my little anecdote of like, that's why I asked that question to this day. When someone, when someone comes to me and says, I'm not making progress and I go, let's diagnose some things. I, I'll, we'll talk about your relationships with your best friends and your spouse and your partners. We'll talk about all that in the next ring. But the core ring is time and money, calendar bank account. Let's look. Does that make sense? Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. And, you know, the original <laughs> question, well, the original question was, you know, why, why should we talk about money? And then when you bring up people's time and people's money, you're basically pointing at where are their priorities and where yes. are they being intentional? Yeah. And a lot of people are not intentional with money. And the, here's the thing, here's the ironic thing. And I want to be a hundred percent transparent. Yeah. I have been saying since January, I was going to redo my budget for 2023. Yeah. Well, it's early February, January, January, 2022 or January, 2020, January, 2023. Like okay. we're basically five or six weeks behind on where I want to be in knowing where all my money is going. And part of that yeah. is because I'm in like a huge transition and I'm just kind of like letting that go, knowing that I'm, you know, I, I look at my bank account every day, so I'm not over my skis. I know you love that expression. I'm not <laughs> getting ahead of myself, but one of the things uh, I want to just call out and I'll put the link in the description on an older version of my podcast yeah, called Wi-Fi and Water. I take, I mapped out how I would spend a billion dollars. Oh, and, this is good. I love this activity. Yeah, yeah. And I don't even spend more than like 400 million because I just can't. I just don't even know what to do with it. No. And I set aside money to invest, to keep all the properties alive for the rest of the time. Yeah. You know, um, yeah. because if you've ever been, in, in even a multi-million dollar house that's not in like a very wealthy part of the world, therefore it's a smaller home and a really, really, really nice affluent neighborhood. You don't need, like the average human being doesn't need more than 500 to 600 square feet. That's my, that's my full opinion. That's oh yeah. Opinion. yeah. Yeah. And unless, I can actually, uh, yeah. <laughs> unless yeah, you're and famous actually, and you have to live in this as, as your, as your world, as your globe, you know, like that's what these mega, mega millionaires do is like Bill Gates. Like I can't go out. So why not have a bowling alley? Why not have a Chick-fil-A all in my house? You know, and it's like, I get it. But like, that is such a small percentage. Like, you're right. The average person and even the unaverage person does or just not. Like the, the, the millionaire next door, you know, even, yes. even this guy that you're talking about, he doesn't need no. these crazy things he may want. Society may say that's what he needs to. There may be something in the back of his head that like, that's the narrative that fulfills. But 
for me, yeah. it's like hearing all that is is really telling. And I think yeah. there's this thing too that I've, I've been having a lot of conversations with people about that. Like, great, you're making more money. That's yeah. cool. You know what a cool flex is? Continuing to spend as a percent of the total amount of money you make less. Yeah. So let's yeah. say you're making, and this math does not fit with anywhere in the world right now as far yeah, as like yeah. economics, but let's say you're making $10,000, excuse yeah. me, $100,000, and you only spend 20000 on everything. So that way you're able to kind of keep 80. Now there's taxes in there. I'm not going to, let's just forget taxes just so we can use the math. So you're using 20% of what you take, of, of what you make. It's not mm -hmm. really what you take home. Cause once again, there's taxes and maybe health insurance and other stuff. Yeah. So you have this $80,000. So now all of a sudden you start making 120,000, right? Now 20% of 120,000 would be how much? What, 28,000? 28%. Uh, uh, so uh, oh, 20%. 20 oh. Yeah. Uh, I'm doing yes. it in the calculator. I think yes. it's, yes. I think yes. it's, I think it's 28, uh, 24,000. 24, got it. 24, duh. Great, great at math, clearly. So maybe now you should spend up to 24,000, right? Because now you're making 120,000. But I'm like, how do you spend 20 or even less now that you have your budget? Even if you spend down to 18 from your 20, yeah. you've now built yourself a little bit bigger nest to be able to save or invest or do something different with. Because I think in the United States, and this is true across the entire world, once people start making more, yeah. they start spending more. Because right. there's this addiction that you talk about that you don't like, which is the, I deserve this. Well, now yeah. that I make 200K, I deserve to go on a oh, $13,000 yeah. seven day vacation. So anyways, it's kind of like the Keeping Up With The Joneses, but it's yeah. even different now because Keeping Up With The Joneses used to be, it was that whole idea came post-war America where you and I had our little suburban homes next to one another. Yeah. You would come over and I would say, look at my new appliance. Yeah. And then you would say, honey, we need to go to Sears. And you'd go home and order it from the book and it would show up at the house. Um, you wouldn't order it. You'd probably have to go to Sears actually. Yeah. And then you would have that. And then I would come over and see that you had a different appliance. And then I would want that. Oh, but in yeah. the world we live in now, we don't trade appliances. No. We trade experiences. So I'll see you yeah. go to Cancun. And I'm like, oh, I got to go to Cabo. I That's see you right. go to Cabo. I'm like, oh, I got to go to Bali. I see you see me go to Bali. It's, and and it, there's no end, right? That's and right. the money just keeps going up. And if you're not having a conversation about what you've laid out, which I think are two really important things, which are, uh, priorities and intentionality, yeah. Yeah. And then things get out of whack quick. Oh, yeah. You know, the phrase I once heard um, was, we don't exchange value, we exchange values. And people forget that these words are connected. And, and I love, if you know me now, I love words because words carry intentional meaning. And if we spent time on just the meaning of the words we're already using, we would be rich. And so when we think about values and value, it's like, wait, you know, I went out to dinner with my friends and they were all drinking. And I know that you mentioned this example in the last Friday finances, uh, this friend who drove an Uber and everyone was going out partying. We talked about saving double and all this. Um, what, what this person has done is if the person, instead of going to Uber, gives in and goes out with their friends, what they've exchanged, not even with their friends, but with themselves, they've exchanged their values. They said they valued breaking away from society and the man and becoming financially free, but they exchanged that with a value and that was the people pleasing value in the moment, the short term value. And so their values shifted and the, as such, they gave away hard value. And, and then they also gave away, as we know, future value, because, you know, we talk about whether it's the price of Bitcoin or gold or real estate, net wise assets grow like net wise it doesn't matter if it's inflation or not if you can create distance between yourself and the joneses down not up if you can create distance between you and the joneses down in terms of exp uh, consumer expenses and then re change that you've given value to your values which is super important i had a you'd appreciate this i had this multi-million dollar real estate mentor i refer to him now and again um and I had read Thinking Grow Rich and, you know, asking for mentorship. So I found this guy and he had made a lot of money in real estate and he was Mr. Walmart. He would 
always buy Walmart clothes and wear Walmart clothes unless he was traveling. And I think I told the story where he had like a $50,000 watch on. Mm -hmm. he, pull, he pulled that out of the closet to travel and he would tell me money is stupid because it only really gives you access and it, no one really wants money. They want what money can get them. And so he would buy the stuff at Walmart. So here's an example of someone who spends money to spend less. So when people would see this guy have an equity event, sell a piece of property, they'd go watch him. The people in his world would watch him go spend on a single weekend, 10 or $20,000. And they're like, see, you make more money, you spend more money. But what was he buying? Well, instead of buying Walmart clothes for that week, he'd go out and buy clothes for the entire year. See, he spent all his money on clothes. Nope. He actually negotiated 20% off. He would do the same with gas. He'd go make a deal and say, listen, how much is gas this year? It's this. If I spent $20,000 in gas for the next 12 months, I'm going to give you this cash right now. And I can only come and get what I consume, but you let me come and get up to X. Then basically he was negotiating on 20% under. So he would do this bulk buy. So people would see him spend more. So they think he's increasing his, his status. Nope. He was actually spending more to spend less. And people forget that like at the early stages of wealth building, you don't spend more to add trappings to your life. You spend more. And he, because he would say this, think about what he's buying. You and I, what is the currency of the rich? You've said this to me and I've said this to you. What's the currency of the rich? Time. That's exactly it. Now we've toyed with the idea that credit is the currency of the rich. And in some ways credit sure. is, is the token of time. Mm -hmm. If we can talk about tokenization of time, ooh, ooh. It's, it's not cash, it's credit. But neither here nor there, they buy time. So when he could go out, how is he buying time when he gets a 20% discount off of stuff for the next year and then the next two years? With every cash lump that comes in, he would also do this with, with credit and credit cards or with his consumer bills. So he would go to the electric company and say, what's my average over the last 12 to 24 months? And they would tell him. And he would go, okay, what if I pay you ahead? And he didn't do directly negotiate this. You can just like pay ahead. He would go ahead and pay ahead but he would get discounts. And you know this, like if we go buy any subscription service, you'd get these bulk discounts. He would just take every bulk discount he could and he would say, Grant, over the next two years, over the next 10 years, over the next 20 years, what am I gonna do with the 20% plus that I'm saving? Real estate, credit. And he said, now that's when everything inverts. And, and then when he said, he came to me one day and said, Grant, I hit my number. It's because he kept playing this gap game of spending more to spend less on consumer thing goods. And if he could spend less on consumer goods, he had more to spend on assets and he just played that asset game all day long. So yeah, so like this idea of language matters. And as we talk about why we're talking about money, let's think about this. You and I have been talking about money. This is also, this is not a crypto show, but why I love talking about crypto is because they are backing into the conversation about money and value. They might be talking about trading. They might be talking about blockchain, which is not cryptocurrency, folks. They might be talking about NFTs, but what they're talking about is learning about value and learning about money. And so like we talk, we, you and I have been talking about this for years, but now we're at a place where we're very comfortable talking about money. So let me ask you, what was the hardest money conversation you had? Hmm. And then after having it, what new options were available to you and or that relationship that can give people an insight of why we should be talking about money? Yes. Yeah, so this is definitely TMI, but with my last relationship, my last romantic relationship, when we met, the reason why I was kind of like, all right, cool. I'm, I'm like, let's meet up. Let's definitely hang out. Like, let's start to talk more. Was because she told me she had a budget. It was like one of the first things she ta we talked about. Whoa. And we totally got money out of the way early. And I told her, totally told her what wow. my plan is and what I want to do. And wow. I'm not, you know, my love language is not gift giving. I know for many people, it's like, it's Christmas. And even I was at the gym yesterday and they had sure. a, they had a, the, the news ticker was, how do you, 
show love for St. Valentine's Day. I'm in Colombia right now. So it was like mm-hmm. Dia de San Valentin without getting into too much debt. Oh, wow. And I'm like, wow, that's crazy. You know, because people would go into debt for Valentine's Day. Yeah, because (laughs) for me, Valentine's Day, I'm like, let's go just hang out all day. All I want to do is hang out all day. I don't care what we do. We could literally paint. We could write poetry. We could go Mm -hmm. play a sport. We could rock climb. We could hike. We could make music. I I don't actually care. You want to watch all the Star Wars? Let's do it. Let's just be together. Because for me, time, what you're talking about as, as a currency is super valuable. Yeah. And so. I think we just had a lot of conversations early on that solidified yeah. both where we kind of are. And I think mm-hmm. I was able to learn where her past was and how it influenced her and where mine was and how it influenced my present and how we both wanted to build moving forward. And so I, knowing that now, mm-hmm. if in any relationship moving forward, that has to be an early conversation because it hasn't been in other relationships. And then yeah. when you move in with someone and you start to buy some things, you know, now my buddy sent me a video the other day of this guy who, and it looks real and it looks real, but like he, he let his uh, significant other go into Target and he's waiting outside and he's like, I'm just going to see what happens. And she comes out after like three hours and she had spent like $800. Stop and the dude, it. Yeah. And the dude's freaking out because he's like, are you kidding me? Chase was calling me. They thought, they thought someone had my card. Are you kidding? Because like he never spends 800 in a one-off on a Saturday yeah. at Target. <laughs> so I just think... I think that that's definitely helped like my romantic relationships. And then with my Mm. friends too, I think I'm very, I'm very open about things. No, I'm not going to spend money on that. You know, Um, one of the things that I do that can be pretty abrasive for many people, but it's definitely me standing in my, like, in my, like being my my truth. truth. (laughs) Yeah, it it is my truth. It's when we go to a restaurant, I'm like, yeah, we're going to get separate checks, separate checks. How do you want to do it? I'm on my own. I'm on my own. Cause people get drinks. I don't really drink when I go to restaurants because I just think it's a waste of money. Um, yeah, they they get appetizers, and most times I can't eat the appetizers because they have something I don't I don't want to eat, and then sure. I get lumped into that because they're like, oh, let's just divide it up evenly. And so that if you're listening to this, you've had that experience where you've been yeah. at a restaurant and you realize you have to put your credit card down on something that you didn't want to pay for just because it wasn't worth having the awkward conversation about money. And yeah. you just said, you know what, the price of having that conversation is an awkwardness potentially is actually worth more than me just paying an extra 10 or 12 bucks. The yeah. problem is if you go out with those same friends every week, every one, you know, once a week, every year, you spend 10 or 12 bucks more, that's five to a hundred, that's 500 to $600 more every year. You're yeah. just letting go away because you're not ready to have a conversation. Um, and so for yeah. me, definitely it's something that's at the forefront of most of my conversations now with definitely with romantic relationships um, and sure. with friendships as well. I yeah. talk to friends all the time. I'm like, you know, do you really need that or do you want that? Um, <laughs> and, and, I, and I, one of yeah. the things too, and this is actually, you know, why I think talking about money is so important is I really think it forces you to think about why you're doing things. Are you doing it for you? I do. Or I are do. you doing it for the gram? Are you doing it so you think you look cool? Are you yeah. doing it so you can tell people about it? You know, yeah. go out and look at your last big expense, whatever that was. Yeah. And if you didn't share it on social media and if you didn't tell anybody about it and if it brought you value that's beyond just social currency, that to me yeah. is cool. Have you, let me ask you this, because we're talking about how we talk about money and why it's important to talk about money and how we think about money. I gave this example of my friend who had, um, he was unconscious that he had a measure of wealth and his measure of wealth was uh, not looking at my bank account and filling up my gas tank. Do you have any obscure ways you measure wealth other than the standard ways of measuring wealth? This is a great, great question. And I was thinking when he said that gas thing, I was thinking that for me, oh, and I had a measure of wealth too. Yeah, my measure of wealth is going to be when I can just travel infinitely. I can put clothes in a bag and I can travel infinitely. And it's not so much that I have built the time because money is time, time is money. And I know that yeah. that's something that's super um, American or from the United States. Yeah. It doesn't always like other countries don't really like that because of the way that we look at money. But yeah. it's not just that I'll have the amount of money to be able to like stay in hostels and, you know, jump from a boat to a plane, to a car, to a bus. Yeah. It's that I'll have the financial security that if I get robbed and they take everything of mine, yeah. I will have a network 
of people that I can yes. even reach out to and say, hey, Grant, I'm in the Philippines, yeah. just been robbed. I'm going to go to Western Union. Can you send me $500? I think yes. your network, the idea of your network being your net worth is so yes. huge. Yes. Um, and that to me is actually bigger because as you start to grow in your wealth conversation, mm -hmm. you're going to have people around you who you've done deals with or you're creating yeah. stuff with kind of like you and I. Yeah. Who, there's just an idea that like, you know what? Um, there's just, a, I probably have like five to six people and I know they're, they're really good friends or they're people like, like you and I who have met and now we formed a, a relationship around creation of something or building sure. or something. I can just hit up and say, Hey man, I need 2000. I'll, I'll get yeah. you back in two yeah. weeks. Can, can you send it over? That to me is my is sign wealth. of wealth. And yes. that is growing every year as I continue to progress and just have conversations like this, bro. This millionaire real estate mentor, and I got to come up with short code for these guys. I don't want to, I want to be anonymous and respectful of their life, but I'll refer to them a lot because I, I observe a lot and I learned a lot from this guy. His buddies who he would see once a quarter because they were all hustling. He only had a small handful, like two or three other buddies. And one, uh, God, I forget this guy's name. He would come in and they would play this game. And this game was, I need $10,000. And this was their accountability. And they didn't do it all the time. It wasn't obnoxious. They would do it once in a while, but without asking why, the other person either had to transfer them money or write a check and not even ask for it back. But they knew and trusted. This was an exercise they did. They knew and trusted that they didn't even say, your turn next. They just had to trust that the next person would pull it, but they couldn't pull it just to keep their capital. The A, and this did several things. The A had to ensure that they always had that money. That always had to be around. Because believe it or not, you can be a millionaire and not have any cash. You, like Elon, we hear this story and we don't believe it. Elon's a billionaire that had to borrow money from a friend. That, that, that tells me that we don't understand billions, right? That tells me that we don't understand what is money and value. And I, I didn't learn what it is. I learned, mm, I might be screwing on this win. This guy would call for his friend and his friend, uh, uh, this guy's friend would call my mentor and say, hey bro, I need 10,000 bucks. Can you do it? And he sat back and his face fell and he was like, I can't. And no one gave him shit. They said, no, no problem, dude. You need any help with anything? It changed to empathy because we understand that true wealth happens equity to equity. True wealth, now, now when we say true wealth though, I gotta be careful with that term. There is a layer of wealth that is equity event to equity event, but what you're talking about, the ability to throw stuff in a bag and go, you know what you made me think is, several times Marissa and I, right now, I will tell you this, right now, Marissa and I have the architecture that we should be able to pack up and just move to the islands and work from there or not work or travel, move to the other side of the world. But there's other problems with that because it's not how much money you have. This goes back to the early part of the conversation where we said there's other cost benefit analysis questions that you're faced with. And more important than the resources you have is how you make money. The rails on which money comes to you and so like, I don't have, I don't have many truly passive income streams. I have my business that makes me money. And honestly, I could check out for probably four weeks and still not be too concerned about money. But I'll tell you this, we moved to Colorado and I had a couple running everything and we checked that off and on, but the couple was needy. And when I came back, they quit on me or there was a, we can't, that we, things came to a head. And what they were seeing is, is Grant's living this opulent life. He can do whatever he wants. And they felt that there was injustice in that. Now, needless to say, I'd been spending eight years at that time building what I had built. And this was just a vacation, but in their mind, it was in one of their minds, this was an unjust act and they should be making more money and I shouldn't be taking advantage of them and blah, blah, blah. And we had to part ways through a series of things. So suddenly delegation, I wasn't making money, my money at the time through my business that my business was generating. What I had to realize is that, oh, I was making money through delegation. And when the delegation rails failed, I had to come back. So I couldn't throw my money, my, my clothes in a bag and just be anywhere. And so I realized, wow, like 
we think having cash in the bank is one thing, but like Andrew, uh, Alex Armozi said, like I sold all my businesses and now, and now I've got eight, nine figures that I'm sitting on, but I am less secure now than when I had my businesses because I, I knew the means by which money was flowing towards me. And, and people don't realize that when you're wealthy, it's like, I might be a billionaire, but how often do the billionaires talk about, look at I'm a Scrooge McDuck millions. They don't talk about that. I mean, why is Elon talking about being burnt out at Twitter right now? I mean, it's not just because I'm bored. It's literally that he took a large chunk of his holdings of Tesla and bought out an entire company. He's responsible for all this uh, employees. He's responsible for a large communication network on the planet called Twitter. But on top of that, this is a means by which his wealth is being built. And you, you can't just like sell Tesla, get rid of all the stock, which is future earnings, put it into Twitter and then just like let it spin because it's not really making any money. So my point is, is why do we talk about money? Not only to build better relationship, like I know more about you now that I know how you measure wealth. Um, you know more about me, potential partners, but also people are misapplying their energy. 40 hours a week. I get it. And tactically, someone could step in. Marissa, she tactically got a job. And though we disagreed on that move at the time, it has paid off because it was a tactical move. And it, it's a tactical move that we can benefit from, but it's not making her more happy. It's not making me more happy, but it is tactical. So there's that delayed gratification. But most people don't do that. Most people wake up and go, this is the easiest way to make money. I'm going to go do this. And they then stop thinking and talking about it. And so now they think they're making progress and they're really not making progress. Hang on, my Google was talking to me. Go ahead. Yeah, I, I think all that is brilliant. And I think sharing how we both, you know, to find wealth or how we see wealth is really important. But what you're bringing up at the end is actually where I think we should leave and transition because I think we, on the next show, we need to talk about Kiyosaki's uh, money quadrant or cash flow quadrant. Yeah, cash flow quadrant made a huge impact in my life. I mean, obviously, uh, Rich Dad, Poor Dad, the previous book, but cash flow quadrant actually gave really good language. So yes, for the next episode, let's 100% dive into the cash flow quadrant. So folks, uh, thanks for being here. Check us out on FridayFinances.tv. Where can people find you, Jared? Um, well, this show really just lives on YouTube. So find me on YouTube at Jarrett yeah. Carpenter, J-A-R-R-E-T-T -T Carpenter. Now that I love that YouTube now has the handles. So that's easy to find you. You know, it's easy to find people. And for yeah, you, yeah. I believe it's Grant Sparks. It's Grant Sparks. Find FridayFinances.tv or just go there and you'll be able to find links to this show. Check out the links below. And if there's specific topics on money you want us to break down, comment on, tear apart, bring to you or resources you think you need. We're offering that. That's what we're doing at FridayFinances.tv. Thanks so much for being here, folks.